the book of Acts is probably among the most familiar of portions of the biblical text to us, which in some ways, I think I've made mention of this before, is a great thing because it allows us to meditate on that and to think about it carefully and uh, every time we come to it, maybe get a little bit deeper into the text because we've been able to maybe get some of the surface level things and we know those well. Uh, I think that's one of the, the great uh, values of studying books that we're familiar with. But another thing is maybe sometimes uh, we think we're so familiar with it, maybe that we, there's not anything left for us to get out of it. But I think as we've gone through this book, study the book of Acts, at least for me, I've seen that that's not the case at all, that I, I'm seeing new things every time we go through. And uh, it's extremely helpful to think about those first people who tried to be followers of Jesus. And I think we would see that just like us, they weren't perfect. Uh, but as they look to the apostolic ideal and as they're trying to be what God wants them to be, I think we can, we can learn a lot of powerful lessons. And among the chapters in the book of Acts that would be the most familiar, I think Acts 8 would be the most familiar within the book of Acts, uh, Several, uh, especially the latter half of the chapter. But all that is to say, I think there's a lot of good that we can gain by studying this, ultimately seeing uh, not only what people, what the, the message that's preached and how people respond, but even God's role in directing some of that as we see here uh, in, in, the, in this chapter. Uh, anything you'd like to say as we jump yeah, in? Yeah, so does anybody remember, uh, I, I think we emphasized it a little bit, maybe not as much this cycle through as we have in, in times past. What's kind of an outlined verse in the first chapter that kind of lays out what we're going to be looking at through the book of Acts? That's right. Verse 8 uh, there, so you have these divisions. You know, you're going to wait in Jerusalem for power, then you're going to preach in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so what we have is uh, in chapter 5, uh, up to chapter 5, from 2 to 5, you have in Jerusalem. And then in chapter 5, you see from the surrounding area people are coming. And now what you're going to have in chapter 8 is you're going to see it go to Samaria. And so we're kind of, you know, into that next phase here where it's continuing to spread out. Another thing that I want us to notice here as we go through the book of Acts is how life-changing the gospel is to these people. You know, Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you be born again, these people are living like different people than they were before. Uh, even up to this point where we're at in chapter 7, what we see is we see people that have, have come to Jerusalem for a feast, and it's, it, it just seems like they just stay in Jerusalem. Did they not have homes somewhere? Didn't they have responsibilities to get back to? And yet they don't seem to be in any hurry to get back to those responsibilities. Why do you think that is? They found something greater than what they left. And, uh, and, and I think what we're going to see in chapter 8 here is, again, how life-changing this is for them. And you see that in their action. And what I want us to think about as we look at this is maybe we don't have exactly the same circumstances. Obviously, we don't have exactly the same circumstances as they had. But is our life changed by the gospel? Are we zealous like they are? Maybe we don't have to, you know, leave our homes and so forth, but is our life really changed by it? And, uh, and I think that'll be a, a valuable lesson for us just to be reminded because every time I go through the book of Acts, I'm reminded of that. Wow, look at how these people responded to the gospel, how it changed their life. Is the gospel changing my life that way? So as we come into chapter 8, uh, as far as chapter breaks go, this is one of the, I don't know that it's a bad chapter break, it's just one of the most interesting chapter breaks in maybe in, in the whole Bible because you have, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. And chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul approved of his execution. So we are, we're slightly changing the, the focus here from Stephen to one of the people who's primarily responsible for the persecution against the Christians in general. Now, it doesn't seem to me that with Stephen in particular that he's one of the, the leaders of that, but he's there and he's aware. Um, and, and, and Luke has this habit of doing things where he just kind of introduces a person in a small paragraph that's going to have a pretty major role later on. Uh, he does, did it with Barnabas. Uh, he, he will do it with Saul, who we will know as Paul better uh, later on. And he, he does that kind of along the way. But uh, Saul is certainly approving of what happens to Stephen. 
And then, uh, so we see that in chapter 8, verse 1. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, someone suggested to me that uh, maybe this phrase, you know, they laid down their yeah. clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul, that maybe that indicated a, a leadership or oh. oversight position. Okay. Now, yeah. that's the first time I'd heard that. Yeah. But, uh, and they compared it to, uh, you know, they, they brought the proceeds and laid them at the apostles' feet. The yeah. apostles were kind of overseeing that at that point. And uh, so I don't know. That's a mm-hmm. that's a new thought to me. But maybe yeah. maybe that does indicate more. I've always no, what you right. said is just you know he was at least an observer of this and approved of yeah. it. But maybe maybe he was already in more of a, a leadership role here. I don't know. Well, that does make a lot of sense given what we see in other texts about the role that Paul takes in the persecuting of the Christians. So uh, a couple of passages that I was just thinking of was uh, Galatians chapter one and verse thirteen, where Paul says. Uh, you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Uh, then you've got Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6 where he's making the case for his kind of Jewish credentials. And he says, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Later on in the book of Acts, he will say, it wasn't just that I was content to you know, deal with them as they came up, but he was pursuing them, chasing them even to foreign cities in order to to drive out and squelch the Christian influence. And so not only do we have Stephen's execution, but it's almost as if that is, it, it's, it's the crack in the dam that now all of a sudden the persecution can just unload on the Christians. And I think one thing that may be part of that is in chapter 6 where you have the 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 synagogue of the freedmen and the chief and the council, they are able to stir up the people. I, I, I don't think it's... Um, I, I think we we see correctly when we see at the beginning of the book how the people had respect for them. The people had respect for them. Gamaliel was respected by the people. That's brought up over and over and over again. And then as soon as the people are kind of, now they're on edge with regards to what the Christians are saying, now that's exactly what the Sanhedrin needed in order to, for this not to be a political disaster for them. Now, ultimately, all of this is in God's hands. Uh, and I, I don't know particularly that, that God was saying, okay, now I ordain that Stephen dies. I don't know that that's what's happening. But God is using every bit of this to accomplish good for His kingdom. And as we've talked about that outline in Acts 1 verse 8, it began at Jerusalem and then Judea, and maybe we've made it that far with the preaching of the gospel, but I certainly don't think we've made it further than that. And I don't know how far along in the timeline we are, but God is going to use this persecution against Stephen and then the, and then the, the Christians to push the message beyond where it was at, the, at that moment and, and more towards the uttermost parts of the earth where it's intending on going. And isn't it just like God mm. to use a disaster to accomplish, to further His purposes? And, uh, I mean, we just see that all the way through. The, the, the greatest event in, in divine history is the disaster of His Son being rejected and executed. And yet that's also the, the greatest blessing that comes upon mankind. And so uh, you look at this and you, you think, well, the gospel's doing pretty good in Jerusalem. And, and God may be looking at this and saying, yeah, it, it, it's, it's stopping there, though. We need it to go a little further. And uh, how can that happen? Well, maybe there needs to be a disruption in Jerusalem mm-hmm. to allow that to happen. Yes, yeah, Stephen falls into a long line of people, messengers rejected from God, whose rejection ultimately works to the greater good of God's people, right? So think about Joseph, for example, mm-hmm. Moses in some ways, the prophets. Uh, not that that ultimately works for their good, but it, they are pointing forward to, to what was coming. And then Jesus, of course. And Stephen, even as he dies, he reminds me of Joseph in some ways, right? Rejected, but ultimately his death is going to provide for the salvation uh, of many people as, as the message is spread. Um, and, and I think that comes because he's being a follower of Jesus. And that's what happens when you follow Jesus is then life or death, your, 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 what you do serves to glorify God. So notice at the end of verse 1, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So as a result of this persecution, they go everywhere, which is just like practical logistical sense, right? The, the, the persecution comes and they go everywhere. But as they go, what are they doing? 
they're preaching the word. And, and I think you made mention of this when the apostles were arrested and the angel comes and releases them. And they could have said, we escaped that one, right? And this is a similar situation. They've just been driven from their homes. They are, they're, they're being chased by this man Saul because of their preaching of the word. And when they go to these other places, they don't say, well, maybe we should lay low for a while. And they don't say, well, I'm glad we got out of there, but we can't risk that again. They go everywhere preaching the word. And, and you made mention of how people's lives are changed. This is an example of that. That when they go, they have different priorities and, and, and emphases than maybe they would have if they had left their homeland at a different time under different circumstances. They go and preaching the word is on their minds. All right, so I, I don't know where they're going as far as maybe they're going back to their home, home territories mm -hmm. uh, for those who had come. It seems like some in Jerusalem would be from Jerusalem and they have had to go other places as well. So it may be completely new territory that they're going into. What do you suppose? Do you suppose it's easier to preach to everyone that you're familiar with or to everyone you're not familiar with? Not familiar with? Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that. I, I, I think the challenge, though, of going somewhere where I don't know anyone, I don't have any connections here, I don't have any support here, and yet what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the very thing that got me driven out of the place where I did have support and, and connections. And, uh, and, and so I guess I would just say this. If we're not preaching, it wouldn't matter location. I, I really think that's, that's the case. Uh, if, if we're not preaching at home, we're probably not going to be preaching if we were scattered. Uh, if we would preach when we're scattered, then we would be preaching at home as well. And so uh, our circumstances are different in that we've not been persecuted and been scattered. But I'll tell you this, if we're not doing what they're doing, then the gospel hasn't changed our lives like it changed theirs. And, uh, and that's, I, I'm speaking to myself <laughs> in that. But that's, uh, we see that. That's what the gospel does is it causes people to say, hey, I have a new purpose. There's a kingdom and I'm working for that kingdom. And that requires me to tell people and talk to people about that. Let me make a, a, a comment. Uh, you had, had referenced this already, but I'd just like to, to read it. Uh, verse 3 talks about Saul making havoc of the church. Does anybody have a different rendering there from havoc? Ravaging the church, all right? Uh, bad stuff's happening here. He's entering how, every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And so it's not like he's just going after leaders. He's going after everyone that's involved with this. Later in the book of Acts, in, in chapter 26, here's what Paul would say, or Saul would say, looking back on that. He said in verse 9, Indeed, I'm in chapter 26 of Acts, verse 9, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and, as many, of, and many of the saints I shut up in prison. And having received authority from the chief priest, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. You see the uh, dedication he has in this. You see the emotion that he has in this. Uh, enraged against them. Um, and, and you think about what takes place there. You know, how do you, how do you get them to blaspheme? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not like, excuse me, would you mind denying Jesus for me, please? You know, that, that's probably not going to do it. And so it's probably going to take something that uh, we would look at as uh, torture, uh, threatening families, things that uh, it just, and you look at that and you think about what's taking place there and how difficult it would be. Uh, you know, he's, he's, Christians are dying. And Christians are, are being tortured. And Christians are suffering. And Saul is all for it. He's, he's determined to stamp this out. So that's what he was doing, wreaking havoc in the church. Thoughts, comments through chapter 3. Where are the apostles at? They're staying in Jerusalem. They're staying in the center of the, the hot area. And, uh, and continuing to, to preach there. Because up to this point, how many local congregations do we know of? Just the church in Jerusalem. And they're kind of staying there and intending that. 
as Saul is trying to make havoc of the Christians. All right, so as we made mention of verse 4, now they went about, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And then we have, I think, one example of, of a man who went about preaching the word, and that is Philip. Uh, and, and that's something that's interesting about the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 2, I think maybe all the apostles are talking, but we have Peter's sermon recorded. Acts 8, I don't know how many disciples, I mean, we know at least 5,000 plus, right? Um, are, are, and I would guess it says all of them were scattered. So I think probably what we have is we have one example of the kind of thing that was happening in lots of different places. Uh, and of course, Samaria was, is significant because of what Jesus had said about the spread of the gospel. So verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out from many who had, hit, who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. So as Philip comes and he's preaching, he's preaching the message of Christ, which I think we could summarize pretty easily by looking at the message that Peter has preached already. He's been the primary one we've heard the sermons. And then Stephen, really the idea that you rejected him, the Samaritans would not have been as directly guilty in that. But they, that Jesus had been rejected, but God raised him up and exalted him and put him at his right hand where he now sits as Lord in Christ. Now, what compelled them to listen to that message that, that Philip was preaching? The miracles. And I think that's exactly the purpose of the miracles. And we talked about this when we were talking about the book of Luke. Uh, the miracles were never done for their own sake in the book of Luke. Jesus is never doing miracles just to do miracles. He's doing miracles in order to point people to the truth of his teaching. And that's what's happening here. Philip comes and the first thing that's said about him is he's preaching the Christ. And the first thing that's said about the people is that they heard him with one accord. But then we understand why. Because they saw the casting out demons. They saw the healings. And that was okay. That that's what caught their attention. But that wasn't enough. They had to pay attention to the message that was preached. And they were. They were paying attention to it. They were heeding it. So we've been kind of just casually making notes of this. Who have we seen work miracles so far in the book of Acts? We saw the apostles. Anybody else? Stephen, was Stephen. Doing signs and wonders. Yes, Stephen. And now we have Philip. Philip. All right, what do you know about Stephen and Philip? That's right. They were, they were two of the seven whom the apostles laid hands on them, and now we see them performing miracles. All right, so we just tuck that away, keep that in our mind, because uh, we're, we're kind of piecing this together as we go here, trying to figure out how this works. And, uh, and so that's something else to, to keep in mind as, as we go through here. Uh, the Samaritans, um, any exposure to Christ? Yes. Jesus passed through Samaria, right? How, how, how was he received? He, yes. Well received there. Now, I saw, I saw some of you like not sure how to answer that, and I understand why, because there were times where he was passing through and they wouldn't receive him because he was on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, they rejected him as a Jew. But when he had opportunity to, to, to teach in those areas, it seemed that the Samaritans were more open to him than the Jews were. And uh, so can you imagine that uh, here sometime before, I don't know exactly the timeline there, so maybe, maybe a year earlier. Maybe would, I don't guess it would be even quite that long. Uh, Jesus had passed through, and uh, maybe you weren't there in Sychar to see Jesus, but you've heard about what took place there. And now all of a sudden, here comes this man, and he begins to preach about this same Jesus whom you've heard about, and he's able to perform signs and wonders. You heard about that he was able to come and tell this woman all that she ever did in her life, but now you see this... This man who's a disciple of Jesus coming and he's performing miracles and so forth. So you can see how that groundwork has been laid and how this would be very fertile soil for the gospel. And, uh, and Stephen is having great success there. Yeah, and I imagine just some of the things that Jesus taught probably caught... Philip. If I said Stephen. I think oh, yeah, Philip. Yeah, well, if a, if a Samaritan ever caught 
wind of some of the things Jesus was teaching. You mean he taught a parable about a good Samaritan? You know, just as the, as the rumors spread and they hear somebody talk. And I heard about this Jewish teacher who told a story about a good Samaritan. I heard he told a story uh, about a, an event that really happened where a Samaritan came back and thanked him for healing him for, uh, from his leprosy. You know, just stories like that of, well, maybe there's something different about this man, even if you had never met him. And so like Lonnie's saying, the groundwork is being laid. Philip comes and preaches and says he wasn't just a miracle worker. He wasn't just a good teacher. He was the Christ. He was the one that the Old Testament had promised and pointed to. And really, the Samaritans were looking forward to that person too. Uh, they looked at, at Moses' promise from Deuteronomy chapter 18 that God would raise up a prophet like me. Uh, and, and the Samaritan woman, I think, references that in, in the idea of, from John 4. And so they're looking for that too. And, and so as, as Philip comes and preaches... Uh, preaches there's much joy in the city for lots of reasons right the message about the christ the healings the casting out demons all this thing uh, all of these things uh luke lacks the word joy he uses it over and over in the book uh, and these are the kinds of things that bring joy the message about the christ and healing and and freedom from demon possession all right anything uh, through verse eight something else anybody all right so verse nine but there was a man named simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, and he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So there's this man named Simon. And what was his former life? What was he in? A, in? He was a sorcerer or a magician. Yeah. Uh, and so when Montezic says uh, he practiced magic, but this is not a guy who practices street magic and does card tricks. This is probably somebody who is, is tied into probably some kind of uh, dark part of, uh, of uh, society. I, I, I don't even know the parts of society you would go to to get tied <laughs> into this sort of thing, but evidently he did. Uh, and, and actually, there's kind of a long record of Jewish and Samaritan sorcerers, magicians who try to tie into the supernatural uh, and, and, and work what, what might would have looked like miracles or, or sorcery. Uh, but he, he's convinced a lot of people, uh, at least at this point. And what does he claim about himself? Yeah. He claims that he's great. Yeah. All right. So what do, what do you think about somebody who is practicing something uh, in, in a way to make people think that he's doing something great by the power of God when he's not? A deceiver. So this is not a good guy. I mean, the way that he's built his life is on deception and fraud and uh, manipulation. And so you look at this, this is not a good guy. But uh, what happens when he hears the gospel? He believes. And, and I, I think probably, you know, maybe in some ways, he is in a position to be more impressed by what's taking place than maybe some other people. Because uh, what he knows is he knows how, how people sometimes believe stuff that's not real because that's how he's made his living. But he also knows the difference between what's phony and what's genuine. And what he sees in Philip is genuine. And uh, this is something that's totally new to him in that, in that regard. And so he becomes a believer in that. And I think, I think this is recorded here. I think his testimony is important because, you know, uh, I'll be honest, there are, there are street magicians or whatever that uh, if they claim to be doing this by divine power... I would say, eh, I don't think so. And they would say, well, then tell me how I'm doing it. And I'd be like, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how you're doing it. I can't explain it. Uh, but, but Simon would be in a position to be able to explain what's phony. But uh, he's not seeing what's phony. He's seeing what's genuine. Yeah. So it's interesting to me that in verse 11, he had amazed them with his magic. But notice at the end of verse 13, mm. when he saw the signs of great miracle, miracles performed, he was amazed, right? And, and so uh, as, as long as making that distinction between the way he was amazing people 
he sees this and he says, now that is amazing. Uh, and, and so I, I think it's interesting, verse 13, even Simon himself believed uh, that, that even this guy who had made his life on deceiving and trying to get people to look at him has now turned his attention away from himself into the message that Philip is preaching. Now, speaking of that, what is the content of the message that Philip is preaching according to verse 12? A couple of things. Right, yes, the good news, right? our word gospel, the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And I think that fits with what we've seen in the rest of the book about the message. So the disciples at the very beginning are asking about the kingdom. Is this the time? So maybe we haven't had anything specifically, at least that's coming to mind, to say, yes, the kingdom has arrived, but Philip is preaching the kingdom, and he's preaching Jesus as the Christ who would be the king of that kingdom. Uh, and, and the word kingdom doesn't show up a ton in the book of Acts, certainly not as much as it does in the book of Luke, but it does show up at some strategic moments. And here is one of those, where the message is going out to the Samaritans, and his message is described as the good news about the kingdom of God and the name or the authority, the power of Jesus Christ. And when they heard that message, so he had two kind of core elements to his message, good news about, Jesus, about the kingdom and about, and about Jesus, and there were kind of two key ways in which they responded. And what were those? What did they do in response? They believed and, and were baptized. Right? Which is a pretty common pattern as we go through the book of Acts. Uh, I would say that it happens every time that there is a conversion that people are, that believe and are baptized. It's not always mentioned. Both of them are not always mentioned. But this is the kind of thing that happens when people hear the good news of the gospel. They believe it. They trust it. They put their confidence in it. And then they are baptized for the same reason Peter said in Acts 2, so that their sins would be remitted, forgiven. And Jesus said that he who yeah. believes and is baptized, what? Will be saved. And so I think, you know, what, what Luke is telling us here is that these people are coming to salvation. What about Simon? Him too. He's coming to salvation too. It sure is. Yeah, I think it's important to note. So Tom Hawley pointed this out. Uh, it's, it's been years ago, but it had stuck with me that sometimes people would look at a situation like this and say Simeon, um, uh, si Simeon. Simon would, did not really believe, that he was just kind of converted. But notice who says he believed. It's not Simon saying he believes. It's Luke, the inspired author, saying even Simon believed. And so anytime you have a question, go back and say, well, who is it that's saying that about this person? And I think that's helpful here because Luke is saying, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Simon believed and was baptized. And he continued with Philip. This is somebody who's, who's sticking with them and is actually amazed at the signs. Luke says so. Uh, so this is not somebody, at least from the way I'm reading the text, it's not somebody who is pretending to be converted. Uh, it's somebody who is, is really convinced by what's happening. Any other thoughts, comments? Through verse 13. All right, verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you're poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So they testified and preached the word of the Lord, and they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. All right, so uh, the apostles were still in Jerusalem. Well, that's where Luke left it as he re re referred to them still being in Jerusalem. But they hear that the gospel has come to Samaria, and, uh, and they feel that it's necessary for them to go. Why? 
they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think it, 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 as Luke continues to convey this to us, it explains what that means for them to receive the Holy Spirit. So they travel to Samaria so that they may receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit does come upon them. How does it come upon them? Through the apostles' hands, through the laying on of the apostles' hands. All right, now we've been suspecting something at this point. We saw the apostles working miracles, and then we see the apostles laying hands on people, and now they're working miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now it just comes out and tells us that it's through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given. And uh, now it's, it's mentioned in passing because it's telling a story here about Simon. So we're going back to Simon. And again, I think that this is recorded by the Holy Spirit to give us some insight. Uh, Simon, what was his previous life like? All right, a deceiver, not a good guy, right? He believes and is baptized. What is he now? He is a Christian. He is a saint. All right, but he sees the, the, the laying on of the apostles' hands and that the Holy Spirit is given by that way. And what would he like to be able to do? He would like to be able to do that too. Now, why? First of all, there could be a lot of motives. But as this story continues to unfold, I think we have an idea of what the motive is. What's the motive? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So when we became Christians, were there any long-standing practices that were particularly tough for us to break? That became temptations, things that we had done for years that were sinful and wrong, and now we become Christians and we say, boy, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves in that situation again. Uh, it's interesting. He saw the apostles. Do you know how many, how many temptations start with seeing? Eve saw that the fruit of the tree... The knowledge of good and evil was, was pleasant. Uh, so many of those things. I, I remember somebody telling me one time that after they became a Christian, they gave up alcohol. And, uh, but every time that they would pass by a bar, they had an immediate craving for that. They would see that, and that would bring back that, 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 that long-standing practice that they had had, an addiction with alcohol. And, uh, and there's so many things like that. And I think what we see here is we see... This man battling the same type of things that we battle. Maybe it's not sorcery. Maybe it's not the desire to be great and everybody to think that we're really powerful in some way. But it's it's something. We face this. And that can drag us right back in. Now, I think this is a wonderful story. You had talked about there are some who claim, well, Simon was never really converted because if he was really converted, then he wouldn't have fallen back like this. Well, I think what this shows us is he was clearly truly converted because the inspired writer says that he was. And then he does fall back and his heart is poisoned by bitterness and bound in iniquity. So that's very possible as well. So this is a warning to us that we can fall back into those old temptations and it can cause us to be lost again. And so uh, here's a very stern warning for this individual, for for us, from this individual in in this. Yeah. So... What we've got here is we've got the Samaritans. They obey the gospel. They have not received the Holy Spirit, which I I think we're taking reasonably to be the miraculous gifts that come through the laying on the apostles' hands. Now, here, this is significant. They they had obeyed the gospel. They were Christians without that having happened. Uh, And I think sometimes, especially in in certain maybe Pentecostal denominations or something, there's, there's no, they don't have any way of separating out this kind of miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the salvation that comes. But those aren't tied together necessarily right here. You have them, you have them separated where you have, they believe, they're baptized, they become Christians, and then they have the apostles' hands laid on them. Uh, And then, so moving on to, from that to, uh, Lonnie may mention this a moment ago. If the way that the... Why didn't Philip lay hands on them to give them these miraculous gifts? He wasn't an apostle, right? Now, he had the miraculous abilities because he had had the apostles' hands laid on him. But it doesn't seem to me that he had the ability to pass that on one step further. 
I think the same thing would be the case once the apostles laid their hands on these Samaritans. They would have received the miraculous abilities, but not able to pass them on further. So we have other passages in the New Testament that talk about the purpose and the duration of miraculous gifts. But I think we could pause right here and say, if this is the way that miraculous gifts are passed on, then there would be a, a practical time limit. There would be a, a necessary limit on how long those things are going to last because the apostles wouldn't be able to pass them on forever. In fact, when Simon asks for this privilege, notice that Peter says, you can't buy this with money. You don't have part or lot in this matter. Your heart is not right with God. And so there's, um, this was not his place. This was not his role. And, and I think we, we would uh, assume that from the other things we see in the New Testament about the role of the apostles in passing on these gifts. So uh, back to Peter's answer in verse 20. May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. That's probably how Simon had gotten ahead in a lot of ways before that he could just use influence or he could use money or he could use power to just get what he wanted. And Peter said, that's not how this works. This is from a source greater than can be bought with money. Verse 21, you have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. So what did he need to do? Verse 22, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. I think those are the conditions that, that Simon has to meet if he wants to receive forgiveness. I think this is important. He doesn't have to be baptized again. That's not what's called him. What it's called him is to repent. So he was, he, he was a sorcerer. He was a deceiver. He was a, 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 proud, a proud man. He repents and follows Philip. Now he's turned again, and he's going back that way. Well, what does he have to do? Well, he has to turn back. He has to repent. And so that, that turn back has to be made every time we go the wrong direction. We've got to make that U-turn again. We've got to repent again and then pray, if possible, that the intent of your heart might be forgiven. And I think that if possible there is not like, well, we'll wait and see if God is. It's whether or not Simon was willing to meet the condition. Repent, if possible, that the intent of your heart might be forgiven. Yeah, I mean, as much as I don't want to admit that I'm like Simon, mm -hmm. we're all like Simon and that we're going to have to go through that process a number of times in our life. And, uh, and so I like the fact that the Holy Spirit gave us an example here of, 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 of here's what it looks like. By the way, if, if someone said, uh, well, you know, Simon wasn't really saved to begin with. We looked at how we could show that. What if somebody said, well, yes, but Simon's not really lost here. What would you say about that? He wouldn't need to repent. All right, that's very good. What kind of language is used to talk about him here? Your heart is not right. Your heart is not right. Iniquity. So he needs to be forgiven. Okay, yeah. And uh, so I, I think that I, when you lay all that out, I just don't know how you could possibly, by the way, your money perish with you. I, I get the idea he's not just talking about, you know, when you die, your money dies with you. I think he's talking about he's died spiritually here. And, uh, and, and that's what's taking place. And so, uh, so what, what, is Simon, what, what is Simon's reaction to this? Yes. Right. And, and I, think that, uh, I, I think that that's a positive. You know, we, we don't continue to know the rest of the story about Simon, but we're left with a positive about him. And I, what I see is I see a man who was a pretty despicable fellow, who became a saint, who was drawn back in by some of those temptations. And yet what I see is after a stern rebuke, he seems to be headed in the right direction again. And that gives me a lot of confidence that a despicable person like me that's become a saint and is drawn in the wrong direction, can repent and turn and, and be what God wants him to be again. And so I'm very thankful for these type of illustrations through the book of Acts to help me understand this is what it means to live as a citizen of God's kingdom. So. Anything through verse 24? Uh, we may have a couple of things to say about verse 25. But.
Yeah, so I think that's right. I think there were probably several spiritual gifts that could be passed on. And the way it looks to me, like from past, so 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is probably the longest section that we have, I guess certainly. It's the longest section we have that talks about spiritual gifts. And the way it looks to me like is that somebody would, their hand, the apostles would lay their hands on them and those people might receive different gifts, right? So like in 1 Corinthians, in, 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 1 Corinthians, in the only Corinth, uh, in Corinthians, uh, some of them have the speaking in tongues ability and that's making them proud over people maybe who have the prophecy ability. So it looks to me like they have different gifts and maybe didn't have much of a role in deciding which gifts they were given that the Spirit was making those sorts of decisions. So yes, I think prophecy would be one of those things that they would be able to reveal uh, knowledge. There was, there was divine, supernatural knowledge. So 1 Corinthians 13, knowledge will pass away, tongues will cease, prophecy will pass away. So knowledge there I take to be some kind of supernatural knowledge that they're able to know, know God's will through inspiration. While we've got a minute, yeah. and, and we don't have enough to get into the next section, so uh, let, let's just think about this, discuss this just for a second. Why would these spiritual gifts be necessary? First of all, we didn't see a lot of them in Jerusalem. We saw the apostles performing miracles and preaching and teaching and so forth. But now that the gospel's going out in different areas where the apostles are not, we start to see this. Why, why do you think that would be useful, beneficial? Okay. Yeah, okay, that, that's a good point because uh, there was a lot of evidence in Jerusalem. Uh, as, they, as the gospel goes out, there wasn't that background information everywhere else they go, so that adds credibility to that. Very good. What were you going to say? I said to preserve it for the future. To preserve it for the future, okay. That's true. This is brand new information, and, uh, and, and by the way, these are brand new Christians, right? I mean, can you imagine... Here, you've never heard of this, but somebody comes to town, they present this gospel message to you, and you say, that makes sense. I'm going to become a Christian. And then the next week, they head out. You've been a Christian a full six and a half days, and they're gone. You don't have a New Testament. What are you going to do? Do you see why it would be really, really nice? If there were in the congregation that have all been Christians about six and a half days now, there was someone who had the gift of revelation. There was someone else that had the gift uh, of, of, of prophecy, uh, of, of being able to confirm these things. You see how needed that would be at this time. Yes, that's good. The laying on the hands would give some people the speaking in tongues ability mm-hmm. to be able to talk to people who didn't have that same, didn't speak the same language. Yeah, so as we kind of thinking along those same lines and looking at verse 25, notice that so when Philip comes in verse 4, preaching the word, Philip went down to be proclaimed to them to the Christ. Preaching, proclaiming are the words that are used. Verse 25, now when they, I take the they there to be Peter and John, had testified and spoken the word of the Lord. So I'm not necessarily opposed to the general idea of what we think about when we talk about somebody giving their testimony. I think I've made this case before. But in the New Testament, Philip preaches and the apostles give their testimony. They testify. I think that's significant. I don't know that Philip could give a testimony. He couldn't testify in the same way that the apostles could. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't have any testimony, right? He has witnesses that he can bring with him. He has the miraculous powers that he has. But the, the apostles were the ones who had literally seen and heard Jesus with their own eyes and ears. They were the ones who could testify. Uh, so when you think about maybe people claiming to be modern-day apostles or people talking about giving their witness or their testimony or whatever, I just think it's a good, good practice to, as, as best we can, to think about things in a, in a biblical way. I'm not saying that the words we use are exactly the ones they use because I don't speak, speak ancient Greek. But... Mm-hmm. What I am saying is that the concepts, we should try to line those up as much as possible. And the apostles are the ones who testify because they were the ones who were given the role to be witnesses. Philip comes and he preaches and proclaims. And I heard Bill Hall illustrate it this way. Um, you know, I, I'm not a witness. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a, a, somebody who can testify. I am somebody like a court reporter or, or, or somebody who is or a news person who after the trial is reporting what was said by the witnesses. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have anything to back back me up with credibility, mostly the statements and the words of the the witnesses themselves. 
But I think that's helpful to make that distinction. And they had spoken the word of the Lord. They returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. So there's the city of Samaria that receives the word. But it's not just there that's getting the message from the apostles and from, uh, and mostly from the apostles in this case. Uh, a lot of the Samaritans are hearing the gospel being preached. So Jerusalem, check. Judea, check. Samaria, check. What's left? Everywhere Almost. else. Get ready because we're about to start that process. Right. Any comments through verse 25? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so for those on social media, Brother Gerald brought up that when Simon brings this up, Peter's reaction is, is pretty stern. Uh, he, he could have just said, ha-ha, you don't get the mechanics, it doesn't work that way. But instead, he, he really rebukes him. I think that that's exactly right. And I, I wonder, so maybe this is part of his apostolic privilege, that he sees a little bit deeper into what's going on with Simon, right? It's not just a... You know, and, and it might not be that this same reaction would, would be warranted for every person who asked that question. But for Simon it was. And for Simon it was because maybe Peter knew something about his former way of life and knew the kind of reasons he would be interested in. Now, maybe, maybe anybody would have gotten this same reaction. Uh, but uh, but he, certainly, he certainly answers it firmly and, and sharply. Maybe because he sees some of the underlying root causes of why Simon would ask such a question and knows how how much of a problem this had been for Simon, how much of a problem it could be if it wasn't addressed right now. That it was, it was not just the surface level asking the question that was the problem, it was where his heart was. Your heart is not right with God, and that's the problem here. You know, going back to the, the brother who had been addicted to alcohol, had become a Christian, drives past a bar, entertains the thought of going in, what would you say to him? Well, wouldn't be that big of a deal if you went in there or if you just had one beer. Would you say that? Why not? That's had him before, you know? And, 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 I, and so I, with Simon here, this is what, this is what made him a, a rotten, sorry, no good person. <laughs> and here he is being drawn by that. That's no laughing matter. You can't toy with that. You can't have a soft answer to that, I think. And so I, I think about, you know, there, there are probably sins in my life. There are some things that I would look at, and uh, maybe they're not that great temptations. They haven't really had a hook in me in the past, and I would say that. And I, I think maybe a soft answer could be, no, we really don't need to do that as Christians. But there are other things that I think God would say, boy, you know, that is, I mean, to be a strong rebuke towards that. And you look at, at Peter, he said, I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And uh, I, I think Peter was able to see what was going on, his motive in that. And his motive was he was going right back into that, 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 that old, that old uh, lust and, and desire for power and so forth. And so it, it deserved a very strong rebuke on that. So we, can't, we may not always have that type of insight in rebuking one another. But I do think that uh, when there is a drawback to something that we have had that has really had our hearts in times past, boy, that's a, that's a decisive moment. There's no toying around with that because that's deadly to us. Yeah. And we may very well know the history of a person. You know, yeah. like Jude would talk about different ways of approaching people, um, some snatching out of the fire. You know, there are different ways, rebuking strongly, some, I think, different ways. Um, Maybe that wouldn't be as accepted in our culture, you know, if you, if you respond sharply. Well, you're going to drive them off. Well, Peter says he's already lost, right? You can't drive them any further than lost. we got we got to wake him up. Uh, so here's the thing on the other side of that coin that I think is incredible. He is firm and sharp in his rebuke and says, Repent and pray that if possible the intent of your heart might be forgiven you. On, in the very same breath, it seems that he is really coming down hard on something. He says, But there's a way out of this. Uh, and and I, I think that that's, that's interesting to me. He does not have to be light on sin in order to preach grace. 
Uh, and, he doesn't, and he doesn't have to neglect grace in order to be hard on sin. Uh, he certainly is hard on the sin that has Simon trapped, but he wants him to take the way out. And that's what God's grace demands, is not just saying, oh, well, that's fine, you can keep rolling around in that, but repent and pray that this might be forgiven. Find the way out, and, and that's what God's grace demands. I'm showing you the way out. He's given us that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So Simon had had a lot of influence mm-hmm. in that area. Uh, and, and maybe the rebuke called for that. Uh, you know, here's a public figure. And, and maybe this was a, yeah, that's, that's a good point. All right, well, we're out of time. Yep. And uh, appreciate the good comments. Appreciate everybody being here. And uh, Lord willing, Sunday we will pick up there and begin to talk about the gospel spreading beyond Samaria. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.